English. Welcome everybody to this seminar. My name is Hans Rutenberg. I'm a member of the Moderate Party in Swedish Parliament, and this is an arrangement of all eight parties in the Parliament. Uh, we have invited four guest speakers from Hong Kong, as you can see in the message at the side. And one of them, Cheryl, in De Deputy Editor-in-Chief, Epoch Media Group in Hong Kong, was supposed to speak directly from Hong Kong, but Unfortunately, she will not be able to join us. The reason is the situation in Hong Kong today, and it's even more sensitive. She and her daily work might be risked by talking to us here. Therefore, she asked her Swedish colleague, colleague Mr. Vasilios Zupundis, to take her place and tell us about the media situation in Hong Kong. Uh, for all you to know, this seminar will be recorded and broadcast on YouTube later. For your information, only people who talk will be visible in the recording. And you can always mute your video if you don't want to take any of Please, as we now have learned since March, mute the microphone under the seminar while the guests are giving speech. Uh, we are very happy to have Mr. Joya Olsson as the moderator of our seminar today. Joya is a Swedish journalist and writer. He's living in Asia since 2007. And uh, Joya, please take over and tell us a little about yourself before starting the meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hans, and welcome everyone to this uh, seminar. Uh, today, Hong Kong, tomorrow the world, question mark. Uh, and uh, yeah, as Hans just mentioned, we have uh, four very interesting speakers to listen to today. But first, I'm just going to do a very short uh, self-introduction. Uh, I have been working as a journalist and author in Asia since 2007, and I'm currently based in Taiwan. And uh, yeah, why do I moderate this seminar? Yeah, I also have, well, I was asked to do it, <laughs> first of all, but I also have a connection to Hong Kong. I used to live there and I also graduated in Hong Kong. I took my Master of Journalism in the, at the University of Hong Kong in 2010. And uh, I've been covering the, the development of Hong Kong for Swedish media uh, quite close ever since the Umbrella Revolution in 2014. And uh, as I think and hope that some of you in the audience might already know, I recently wrote a book about the Taiwan. Have it here. And uh, right now I'm also writing a similar book about Hong Kong. So it's going to be a book about Hong Kong's uh, modern political uh, history, uh, starting more or less from uh, yeah, starting more or less from the middle of the last century, but focusing on the time after the handover to, uh, to China. So, yeah, I hope, of course, that uh, this book that is the first of its kind in Swedish will, will uh, be read by, by some of you in the audience. And uh, now it's enough with self-promotion. Uh, I will instead leave the word to our first speaker, which is uh, the activist and my friend, uh, Wong Yik Mo, and uh, Wong was a uh, vice convener of the Civil Human Rights Front during the anti-extradition movement in Hong Kong last year, and uh, he's also been working for the Demosisto, the political party that was led by Joshua Wong, but uh, was recently disbanded, and uh, Wong, he uh, recently uh, chose to self-exile self himself uh, to Taiwan, where, where he is now. And uh, yeah, we will see what uh, Wong uh, wants to tell us today. And uh, yeah, Wong, you have your 12 minutes uh, starting from now. So please uh, feel free to talk about whatever you want. Okay, thank you, Yoye. Um, thank you um, to MPs for coming today. Um, I believe many of you know the background of the Hong Kong movement protest already. So um, I will only focus on the very limited things. So um, the movement started um, as an anti-extradition movement. And we know the danger of the bill because it will put everyone in danger. So um, that's how it broke out. But um, during the whole movement, it uh, turned into an anti-police violence movement. Um, the major reason why people, why uh, two million people took to the street and even fight at the front line is because um, they're against police violence. 
Um, I would like to focus on the five demands that we have. Um, so three of them are uh, withdrawal of the extradition bill, and that one we have succeeded. Um, the next one is independent investigation to police violence, which we haven't got, and this is not going to happen um, as long as China, uh, uh, um, well, Hong Kong government is in power. Um, the last one is free election, which, as you know, the uh, um, election of Legislative Council has been cancelled this year. They said this is a, po a postponement, but we know that's not going to happen. So um, now let's look at the movement itself. Many people said uh, Hong Kong movement is very successful. That so many people took to the streets, so many people supported. We've got the media attention from international communities. But look at the results. So if we look at the movement from the result, um, what we've got now is national security law. Uh, which is um, the reason why half a million people took to the streets to protest back in 2003. So um, from the results, I would say the movement um, has failed. We have lost. Um, I think it is very important to understand that the movement has uh, what well, we have lost. And now um, admitting the failure is very important because only then we will look at uh, what has really happened. So now I would like to um, tell you, uh, give you two examples of the CCP's tactic to, um, to win over this protest. Of course, the CCP is always very good at splitting each other, turning people against each other. That happened during the um, Cultural Revolution back in the days. Um, okay, during the movement, we have slogans called which means uh, we all have our own positions. So someone might be in the front line, someone might be doing lobbies, someone might be uh, earning money and giving, donating money to the movement. But we won't split. We believe in each other. We won't distance ourselves from each other. So it was a strong solidarity during that time to be split. But what happened now is after the movement died down this year, especially after uh, COVID, um, the whole atmosphere has changed because we could not um, go protesting. So uh, we have different focus, focus. And of course, we also believe CCP has sent agents among different people, different groups um, on the internet or uh, infiltrating their personnel into the protesters. So people are now fighting each other on the internet. You might have heard of the uh, Yellow Economy Circle um, that um, I have also introduced when I came to Sweden. So that's uh, basically uh, um, shops and businesses are supporting the movement. And um, we support these, uh, these businesses so that our money circulation will be within the, um, um, the people who uphold the value of freedom. And now people are fighting um, this yellow economy that people are criticizing them, making trouble, and people start to not believe in what people say. So that's a traditional way of CCP to create split. You know, uh, uh, for example, they will say, so shop one, why do you earn so much money? Are you really helping the movement? And then there are fake news, there are fake evidence um, to make people believe in the criticism. So that's the first part of the split because uh, CCP knows economy is its um, um, weakness. And the next splitting is to split between the traditional Democrats and the youngsters. Um, although during the movement last year, uh, many people thought focus on the street protest, we still believed in institution. Um, so we won a landslide in the district council election last year. And some MPs from Sweden uh, also came to visit. We won 86% of the seats. But now Beijing has learned the lesson and canceled legislative council election this year. Um, well, what I see is much more than just canceling the election. Um, CCP has made, it was a very smart move from China because they made um, the existing MPs to choose whether to stay as an MP or not. And in the end, the legislators chose to stay because 
uh, of many reasons. For example, they still want to serve, and of course, salary is very important because without money, without uh, um, um, allowance, it's very difficult to even continue the street fight. So um, they lost credibility. They lost support from the people.、Um, so that's what happened、um, a few months before, and now、um, after China sees that the MPs have lost their credibility, they disqualified four legislators, and finally all the opposition、uh, legislators decided on a mass resignation, which was which has been called by the people. But now this timing is very bad because this has been perceived as a late move, and they've lost people's support. And these two examples are very good examples of CCP's tactic.、Um, no, now nobody can can、uh, protest, and we don't even believe in、um, in the parliament. And I believe this kind of split will also spread to Europe.、Um, Of course, in on the EU level, we have seen Hungary,、uh, Greece,、uh, maybe Italy. So that's how CCP does. And I think I believe you know better than me how、uh, how China is infiltrating in Sweden and in other parts of Europe.、Um, and now、um, maybe people will like to know about national security law. Um, well, for me, it's not interesting. For Hong Kongers, it's not interesting、uh, because that's old news. <laughs> well, for us, every day we see uh, uh, troubles, people being arrested.、Uh, we feel sad, and sometimes you even uh, uh, feel numb about it because、um, you know it's too painful, and we 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 need to focus on what we can do. But anyway, so national security law. There are four areas. Subversion, secession, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces. For example, what I do now,、uh, with for, meeting with foreign MPs and、uh, convince you to take actions,、um, I am breaching the national security law. And it and national security law、um, article number thirty eight is very famous because it says the law shall apply to offenders offenses under this law committed against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. From outside the region, which means you can offend this in Sweden, and by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region, which means a Swedish national committing this crime in Sweden can be a breach to the law, which means Hong Kong rules the whole world. <laughs>、um, all right. So till now, many protesters have been arrested.、Um, they have arrested legislators, and now they are.、Uh, uh, um, Putting their focus on district council uh, uh, members, and two teachers were arrested for discussing issues with students. So now you cannot even discuss with students about independence. I mean, you can say no, that's not a good choice, but China says no, you cannot dis you cannot discuss, you cannot learn whether it's good or not because China is going to tell you whether it's good or not. Um, and even today, Carrie Lam, our chief executive, has said, "Anyone opposing the government can be seen as breaching national security law."、Um, so, the situation now is really serious. You may say this in in I don't know what time Europe、um, in the uh, uh, in the law. So now we focus on what we need.、Um, so yeah, I know I have two minutes. So.、Um, Sweden is a leading country to stand up against China in Europe, as far as I know, because all Confucius institutions have been closed. And I know you have a report of acquisition、uh, from China because you know the danger of China、uh, um, buying off all the businesses, or at least the、uh, important ones. And there's Magnitsky sanction that、uh, um, that we support.、Uh, we think Sweden may take reference from the U.S. But we think、uh, there's much more to do than Magnitsky sanction. For example,、uh, focus on the economy.、Um, there's a huge debate on the、uh, bilateral investment treaty with China by the EU.、Um, I know we we know EU wants to sign it, maybe with human rights clauses, but、um, I don't think the clauses will help.、Um, and EU should use this opportunity with to to bargain with China. For example, to lift national security law in Hong Kong and to have free election in Hong Kong, 
before you sign the treaty. Um, and um, there's a lifeboat scheme um, that um, because Hong Kongers, uh, many of us are leaving Hong Kong, we seek asylum. I would just like to focus that um, Hong Kongers wouldn't uh, bring uh, a, a, a refugee crisis because we're not that many. And I believe majority of us would choose UK or Canada or Taiwan. But uh, joining the scheme will uh, provide alternatives. And Hong Kongers are very diligent as a workforce. And last but not least, I would like to mention that um, Germany has adopted uh, a new Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, as far as I know, France and the UK are also discussing it. Um, I think this is very important during this time, uh, especially under COVID-19, to shift the focus, uh, um, the trade with China to more destinations, because only with the new strategy will Europe be um, more dependent, uh, sorry, independent from China, especially um, in the regard of economy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Wong, for uh, your update. And uh, yeah, I want to remind uh, all our listeners that uh, we have a half an hour for questions after all the four speakers have finished. So please think about uh, what you might would like to ask uh, Wong uh, later on. And uh, yeah, let's proceed to our second speaker, which is Elmer Yuen. And uh, Elmer is uh, a Hong Kong entrepreneur. Uh, now he lives in exile in the US. And Elmer was also one of the first businessmen to enter the Chinese market uh, already in 1977, just after the Cultural Revolution ended. Elmer stepped in and started to do business in China. And uh, for our Swedish listeners, uh, it's also worth mentioning that uh, Elmer has been working a lot with 4G and also with uh, Ericsson, a Swedish telecom company. And this is also obviously a very important topic right now because of the debates we have on Huawei and the 5G in, in Sweden. So let us hear now uh, about Elmer. Uh, he will talk about uh, China in general and his many decades of experiences from dealing with uh, China. So, uh, yeah, Elmer, please talk to us. And how share how much knowledge. time I have? Uh, your how much minutes. time I have? Your 12, 12 minutes. Okay. You have 12 minutes, Elmer, and it starts now. Thank you. I'm very old. I'm 71 years old. I lived total 20 years in China, 10 years in Shanghai, 10 years in Beijing, 20 years in US, and the rest of the time mostly in Hong Kong. I'm a Hong Kong resident. And uh, uh, um, I went to China very early in 1977 to start my factories, making digital watches and other electronic products. And I'm also a partner of Sanyo Japan and also in many, many factories in China. So in the beginning, we all believe that uh, China is opening up. It's one day they are going to be like us. And, we, and that's what we believe. And we, we are Chinese and we are supposed to help our brothers. And that was the relay, That was the, the feeling. And Tan Xiaoping said, you know, Hong Kong, 50 years, no change. And after 50 years, maybe no need to change because China would be like Hong Kong. That's what he said. Uh, dancing, can keep on dancing and horse racing. So we went in and then uh, I opened many, many factory. Uh, at the highest, we were employing almost 60,000 people. And also I invested in the Mission Hills uh, Golf Club. Uh, I was one of the three founders. And uh, after that, uh, they started the, uh, before that they had the Tiananmen uh, incident. And that was a wake up call. Um, we understand that uh, for power, they would do everything. But that wake up call is say, only saying that, oh, mainland, uh, the people, uh, they don't mind. They, they are used to suffering. They are used to uh, have no rights. And then uh, they are different from us. And as long as we have one country, two system, Hong Kong will still be doing OK. OK, and uh, we are different from them. And then uh, they promised. And uh, it's an international treaty. The um, Hong, uh, the, the Sino-British treaty is an international treaty, and uh, they have no reason to throw away because uh, they need the money, need the foreign currencies. So of course, I was at the same time watching uh, Ericsson and many Swedish companies doing in uh, China uh, quite well, quite well. And uh, so anyway, um, Hong Kong since 1997 has been deteriorating. 
they never really kept their promise, but they kept a good appearance. So they were doing things behind the scene and uh, buying up all the news media, mainstream media, and uh, their, their control and influence uh, is coming to Hong Kong and uh, uh, less and less people can speak out. And it's until, um, until uh, May this year, they proposed very abruptly the national security law, which basically means they are taking over Hong Kong. No more freedom, no more rule of law, and no more democracy means they, their law will override all our Hong Kong laws. So that's when I woke up, I said, this is it. Uh, it's not going to be a one country, two system. It's like Donald Trump said, it's one country, one system. So I've decided to stop all my business in China, told all my Chinese partner that they go and talk to somebody else. My, I, will, I will not go back and do business with them. I've decided to be an activist. Activists in try to um, return Hong Kong to something like 1997. It's the pre uh, pre uh, what do you call uh, uh, it's just like like the British rule, but of course we like to have our self rule. <clears throat> so I've decided to, to that uh, to speak out, and I became a pretty popular KOL. I have a few hundred thousand followers, and uh, uh, mostly Hong Kong, and I speak in Cantonese. And uh, after that, I realized uh, I know U.S. quite well. So I realized our only hope, our only hope is to get help from U.S. And they won't help us directly. But U.S. realizing the problem, the trouble of the Chinese Communist Party, they would have to do something. And I arrived in U.S. in, uh, in the end of, uh, end of June end of June, and that's when the pandemic started getting very serious. And up to now, as you know, almost 250,000 people died. Right? And, uh, uh, and then uh, I was fortunate for me and for Hong Kong, because then U.S. start waking up, seeing that China, the virus, this is how they treat the virus, whether it's man-made or whether it's a weapon, but at least they let it out. They let it out, and then they make money on it. And then they deny it's, it came from China. And they, now they say they are the one who can, who can uh, control the pandemic better than anybody else. The whole world should learn from them. We also learn how they control WHO and its chairman. So anyway, the, uh, 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 I'm in US. And then the second fortunate thing for, for Hong Kong is the election. Of course, the uh, China is behind the election, manipulating election, injecting uh, injecting false fake votes, and then changing Trump's vote into Biden's vote. So, uh, uh, as I noticed, the title of this uh, meeting is called "China Win Win," and I went to uh, U.S. I talked to the congressman and also the State Department and the White House. I said, uh, "This is the win win." First, uh, they win in the pandemic, all right? They put the whole world into trouble. And that's the win. It's uh, unrestricted warfare. And the second win is they are getting rid of uh, Donald Trump. And it's, ha it's happening because Donald Trump is the only one who stand up against the Chinese, against the P uh, CCP, sorry. Uh, there's nothing against the Chinese. It's really all against the Chinese Communist Party. So the uh, uh, situation is very, very serious. As we know, Biden is very much like the uh, general secretary of the WHO. He would do anything Xi Jinping tells him to do. Right? So, uh, uh, so if, uh, if, uh, if Biden wins, basically China control the whole world. The whole world. Trust me. Right? They don't even have to bother with this one bell, one row. If they control the White House, they control the whole world. Uh, let's talk a little bit about about uh, Swiss, my, my business, all right? Very difficult to make money in China. It's almost impossible. They let you make money and then you reinvest. The minute you want your money to leave Hong Kong, then the whole story starts. And if you have technology, if you have technology, somehow, somehow, they will steal it, all right? Either they steal it or they use other means, never legal. 
Uh, I mean, uh, I'm I'm looking at the Ericsson from uh, another point of view. All right, you guys know Ericsson far more than me, but I do get this. So I'm I'm in the three G. I have a lot of patents, and I have patent uh, warfare with Ericsson. So uh, in US, uh, my company in US is called Golden Bridge Technology. They know me. So, but then you know, look at it first. China have nothing to do with cellular phone. All right, nothing at all. And how fast they pick up, how fast they picked up, and uh, they really didn't have much patent when it saw when it was three two G, three G they start learning, and then four G basically they took over. Somebody is giving away the shop, and they came up so strong, Nokia, Siemens. Ericsson, everybody's out of the way. You should really be thankful to Donald Trump for security reason. He stopped them dead, stopped Huawei dead. So that's a reason for your business to come back. Okay. And uh, the, the way they do business, the way they Huawei do business, I know them very well. They are one of my licensees. All right, I know them too well. Everything is bribery. Uh, they undercut the cause and everything. And uh, of course, Donald Trump is giving uh, uh, Ericsson a chance to, to 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 survive and do well, right? But then, of course, Biden will be another story. It will completely return to the old situation. And uh, of course, while many countries are woken up of a security con security problem that uh, this thing is causing, Huawei will be causing. But on the other hand, this is the way. You, uh, what if China comes back? They will start bribing again. They will start their, their their way. They have their way. They're very, very clever and very deceitful. That's the word to use, deceitful. So um, anyway, we are on the verge of losing the second world, second war, second unrestricted warfare. And it's very serious. For Hong Kong, I'm speaking for Hong Kong and uh, uh, we the, the kids, the kids woke up. The businessman is very much like a Swedish businessman. They think they can still make money. In the meantime, they are losing their freedom. They are losing their rule of law, and they are losing their home. Millions of Hong Kong people will eventually migrate. Their children will not live in Hong Kong anymore. They're not going to be educated like under the communist way. Right now, we are almost like West Berlin being invaded by the communist. Very much like that, and it's the beginning. They've exerted less than maybe 5% of those uh, clauses in the national security law. And uh, I think uh, within a matter of two years, it's going to be 100%. And they're willing to give up the, uh, the money they make from Hong Kong. They're willing to do that, risk that. So that's how bad it is. And I'm in Washington lobbying and trying to, to work with the U.S. and hoping that U.S. will eventually through both military or economic or whatever currency type of uh, uh, war with, to get rid of the CCP. And then we in Hong Kong will regain our freedom and return to our former glory. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elmer. Uh, now, I would like to proceed right away to our third speaker, which is uh, Basilios Sopunis. And uh, Basilios is the publisher of the Swedish edition of Epoch Times. And uh, he will talk today about an issue that is very close to my heart. And uh, that is, of course, the development of media and uh, the state of press freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, especially the difference uh, before and after the national security law was imposed in Hong Kong uh, this summer. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, I took my Master of Journalism in Hong Kong in 2010. And back then, I remember Hong Kong as a very uh, free and reasonable uh, place for journalists to, to work in. Uh, but I imagine, or I actually know, <laughs> that the situation is uh, very, very different today than back in 2010. 
So please, Vasilios, can you tell us a bit more about the media and press freedom in Hong Kong today? You have the word and your 12 minutes is uh, starting now. Thank you very much, Yoya. Well, um, as some of you may know, the deputy chief uh, editor of the Hong Kong edition of the Epoch Times, Cheryl Ng, she was supposed to be here today uh, to brief you on the situation of the free press in, in Hong Kong. Uh, however, uh, due to security reasons, um, tied, of course, to the new national security law um, that she was actually going to speak about and that has been imposed now on, on Hong Kong by the central government in Beijing, uh, we have decided that uh, you know, she, not, she should not attend uh, because, as we heard here before, uh, the law criminalizes uh, what it calls collusion with foreign uh, or uh, external uh, forces. So uh, I think uh, our esteemed uh, members of parliament attending here, uh, you probably do not consider yourselves hostile enemy forces, right? Uh, but the Chinese regime, uh, they may do that. So, um, so I'm here to brief you shortly on the situation. Um, although I think that uh, the fact that uh, that it is a security risk for Cheryl to attend this seminar uh, actually already gives a clear picture. Uh, I mean, how can you have a free media when you need to consider these issues, right? So, coming to the situation, I mean, of the hundreds of Hong Kong media, there is actually only two you could call independent today, two big medias, uh, the Epoch Times being one and uh, Apple Daily being the other. Um, and uh, probably you heard what happened with the owner uh, of uh, Apple Daily, uh, Jimmy Lai, who was uh, uh, arrested and, and then released again. Uh, he was arrested on charges. It was about uh, having a demonstration, right, without a permit attending a demonstration with a lot of firm. Um, but, of course, um, it was a totally different situation before 97, like we heard here before. I mean, Hong Kong citizens, they would uh, enjoy a free press. Uh, but actually, as Elmer noted, Beijing has, since the 70s actually, been buying stakes in Hong Kong media. And this shows us how the Chinese regime works long term. Uh, to infiltrate and uh, finally take over the free press. And this has been done in Hong Kong. It has been uh, done also, in, it's going on in Taiwan, in Asia, and actually all over the world. And um, because Hong Kong was a free society, so it was easy for China to buy shares in the media. Of course, they didn't buy all the shares uh, at once, right? They used the, the salami tactics where they uh, they bought slice by slice over a 40-year period. So in the beginning of the 80s, about 10% maybe of the papers were controlled by the CCP. You may know of Tsingtao, the biggest one, right? It was an anti-communist paper in the 50s to the 80s, but it gradually went from criticizing the Communist Party to more of a reporting like having an understanding of the Chinese Communist Party and uh, to finally praise the party. So it has been a gradual process, of course. And they had time, because as you may know, they don't think in terms of, uh, you know, quarter of a year like we do here in, uh, in the West. They think uh, in terms of generations, right? So um, you probably recognize the method, uh, because this is also how Beijing has been buying up foreign companies, also Swedish companies uh, lately. And this is what the Communist Party calls, uh, it calls them strangle them with their own system. I mean, strangle the enemy with their own system. So they use our freedoms, like in this case, they use Hong Kong freedoms uh, to buy up the companies and control them. Um, of course, the other way around is, of course, not to think of, right? Because uh, uh, you couldn't go and buy, uh, like, people's daily in China. So, uh, so in this way, 
they have control over the media in Hong Kong. And you may know that uh, Jack Mao of Alibaba, he bought, was it 40% of South China Morning Post, which I would say is, uh, well, the most influential English-speaking uh, media from Hong Kong. So back to today, uh, when we only have a couple of free newspapers left that refuse to be uh, bought or in any other way uh, controlled by Beijing, um, Beijing has uh, actually only one way to go forward, and that is uh, intimidation. So, um, and, and this is also a well-known tactic here in Sweden. I can give you an example uh, from Hong Kong. Our edition of Epoch Times in Hong Kong, uh, they signed a distribution agreement with the chain 7-Eleven, you might know of. And uh, this agreement, it was uh, cancelled uh, by 7-Eleven due to current circumstances. And of course, the current circumstances uh, being that uh, Beijing threatened the 7-Eleven to close all the 7-Eleven on the mainland if they would, you know, go carry through with the contract. So I think that um, what this does here is, I mean, we, this is a very well-known tactic here in Sweden because this is how they work uh, also here, right? I mean, our politicians attending here know very well of this kind of uh, intimidation where they uh, um, approach different different businesses and say, if you do this or if you invite Dalai Lama or if you do that, then we, you know, it will lead to us uh, maybe not uh, doing business with you. So. Um, and for us, I'm thinking here in the West, it's actually a, a warning to us here because Hong Kong was also a free society. So what they have been doing there systematically, continuously and ongoing is exactly the same thing that they are doing in the West. So it is like a Hong Kong gentleman said, uh, he said, uh, if Hong Kong falls, the whole world falls. And uh, I think uh, there's, uh, there's uh, truth to that saying actually. So it started in Hong Kong and uh, and uh, of course I think that uh, people who are a bit um, into this, um, I mean how the Chinese Communist Party is operating, they can see that this is of course uh, in the long run a bigger picture. Right now for example, uh, Elmer you spoke about what's happening in the US, right? So uh, with the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party, Communist Party infiltrating also uh, in the U.S. So this is the quest for world dominance that you were talking about. So um, I spoke uh, this morning again with the Cheryl, and um, to tell you, I mean, what's happening on the ground, uh, they are very afraid right now, and they actually don't know what what will happen tomorrow, because uh, everything is it has become like in the mainland. So uh, anything can happen. So uh, talking about a free press uh, in Hong Kong, I think uh, there actually is no free press anymore in the sense that uh, we knew of uh, before, or in the sense you know that we have here in the West. And as I stated earlier, it's just like I mean we can understand this just from this seminar that uh, Cherry couldn't attend because of this national security law, right? So this actually says everything. If, if the, the media cannot speak freely, then there's uh, <laughs> no free media anymore. So um, I guess that, uh, that the sentiments that uh, my previous speakers here have, have conveyed to us is a, a very, um, actually very pessimistic sentiment. And this is also what I hear from Hong Kong and from uh, our editors in, in, in Hong Kong at the Epoch Times. I would say what is important for us here would be that uh, to be informed, stay informed for our politicians to know what's happening. Uh, I know Georgia here has a very nice blog that I follow. I mean, he reports continuously about the situation in China, in the mainland, in Hong Kong. Uh, um, me being the publisher of the Epoch Times, uh, you can read the Epoch Times, we have the Swedish edition. Uh, I will ask you here to 
to send our new e-paper to to all the politicians and everyone here attending uh, to keep being informed and follow the situation what is happening uh, and then i think that uh, our our swedish politicians will um, be able to follow their conscience and take the right steps uh, of what everyone actually would think is is important for Hong Kong right now. Thank you very much, Yoya. I think I stop here, right? Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. And uh, of course, I must agree uh, that it's very hard uh, to uh, follow what's happening in China and Hong Kong in the Swedish media, especially during the American election campaign. There has been a lot of focus on the election uh, when it comes to the foreign foreign uh, reporting in, in Swedish media. So yeah, uh, yeah, follow my blog as Vasilius uh, recommended, but, but also I, I would recommend even more that uh, uh, yeah, read uh, international media when it comes to China and Hong Kong because it's very many international medias that has uh, reporters on uh, on site both uh, in Hong Kong and Taiwan and even still in China even though it's increasingly few. Uh, so yeah, uh, when it comes to China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the region, uh, please also follow international media closer uh, for, for Swedish listeners. And uh, yeah, and then we have uh, only one speaker left, and uh, we're looking quite good time wise. So I guess it will be about uh, half an hour for, uh, for questions uh, after we have heard our fourth speaker, and that is Ann Manian, who is. Uh, Director of uh, International Societies of Human Rights, the German branch of this organization that is also uh, co-hosting this event. And uh, Anne has been working in China also for uh, about three decades. Uh, he worked for the Swedish company ABB and uh, he was focusing on marketing and uh, sales for the global market. And now he's a frequent speaker in international forums. And uh, Anne is going to talk today about uh, yeah, a topic that is uh, something that creates a very, very big uh, uh, worries in, uh, in many countries, but it's also hard to grasp because it's a very complicated uh, topic. And it's about uh, China's, uh, what you can call it, warfare with modern technology and artificial intelligence and the big data and, and so on. And also uh, the party organization United Front, which uh, for our Swedish listeners is uh, maybe better known as Enhetsfronten, which is a party organization that uh, uh, has one of its most important tasks is to uh, try to rally support for the Communist Party, not only in China, but also abroad. So this is uh, kind of covert operations uh, together with some uh, uh, high technology issues. So please, Anman, uh, let us know what you want to talk about. Your 12 minutes is starting now. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Actually, my experience uh, with China, I mean, business experience with China, uh, has some similarity with Elma. Uh, I also thought that, you know, in the 80s, that uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party is uh, uh, ready to reform, yeah? So, so I was actually thinking, oh, okay, so good that, that to do business with them, you know. And uh, uh, so I was actually one of the pioneers for my company to to break through in the Chinese market. And uh, within a few years, I also managed to help the company. Uh, if we only look at at that time, only foreign companies in the area of uh, we call it power system automation, a very high tech uh, technology. Uh, we we managed to get something like 65 percent of the market share which is a huge market share yeah so uh, in a way i was the one who, who who was cheated by the communist party but uh luckily i was probably also one of the first one who woke up in in my company abb because i actually suggested uh, i think it was 2004 already uh, to, to exit China, at least within that technology. The reason is very simple, two reasons. One is like uh, Elma mentioned, is a lot of bribing, a lot of corruption. And the second thing is, uh, they, they, they buy just because they want to get access to the, our technology. 
And in, you know, any means is good, bribing everyone, including but try to bribe me. Yeah. So, um, and uh, I'm happy today that uh, that suggestion I made uh, to the to the group management uh, uh, is correct. I still insist that it's correct. And I think uh, more and more people agree to me after now 15 years or so that uh, that suggestion was uh, correct. And we did it also. So, uh, so here I, I, I mentioned this because I just want you guys to always remember the the leaders of the communist parties, they are master of deception. Remember that, they are master of deception. For them, the principle they really believe in and always follow is the end justifies the means. So any means is okay for them. Lies, deception, and killing, okay? Killing in openly, killing uh, behind the scene, and so on. Now, for two years ago, I deliver a speech at the European Parliament uh, in a conference about China, particularly about China human rights. And I ended my speech by saying, ladies and gentlemen, China is the biggest present danger of our world. And it is already five to 12, five minutes to 12. And today I want to tell you, no, it's not five minutes to 12, it's three minutes to 12. So if European and many other people in the world, in the free world, do not wake up and act, it can be, you know, too late. So today I would focus on the question of uh, AI, artificial intelligence and big data. Well, AI is a huge area. I actually also work a little bit with AI when I was still uh, before my retirement. Yeah, uh, AI, you know, is a huge area. You can starting from you know uh, intelligent robot who can uh, act like a human uh, to uh, autom fully aut automated uh, car driving and all the way to uh, facial recognition, uh, you know, and uh, uh, body language recognition and so on and so on. Now. Uh, we know that in Hong Kong, for example, they have also mon uh, uh, installed many monitoring uh, cameras yeah, uh, with the aim of being quickly to identify every person who may be a so-called risk for the Communist Party. And that is nothing that they started a few years ago, no. <clears throat> I remember about 15 years ago in a general assembly of the company Oracle or shareholder assembly, sorry. Yeah? One very clever uh, shareholder, he was raising the question to the top management of the company Oracle. He said, are we aware that one of our biggest customer is a Chinese company and buying our most expensive and most advanced uh, uh, database machines, super database machine. And I have the inf uh, information that th behind this company is MSS, which means Ministry of State Security, the Chinese uh, Secret Service. Yeah? And are we aware of that? And what is our policy? That was his question. Yeah? Unfortunately, uh, in most uh, big tech company in, in, in California, uh, money play a bigger role than uh, other things. So, so already 15 years ago, they systematic, at that time, they did not master so much of AI and big data. So why they buy all these super database machine? Because they need that to process all this huge amount of data not only for Hong Kong, but the whole China, and not only the whole China, the whole world. Yeah. So why you need all this data? Well, I tell you, to make it simple, yeah, not to become too technical, uh, person, person recognition. It is like uh, building a puzzle picture. You know, the more puzzle bits you have, the more puzzle parts you have, you can build more picture, right? And, but you need a certain intelligence to, you know, in case you have, uh, you know, thousands, thousands of puzzles and how you manage to pick those puzzles and build a picture, that is artificial intelligence, or one part of it, yeah? And so they started a long time ago 
to identify uh, artificial intelligence, big data, and all the high tech is a way for us to, so to say, be more superior to the West. They knew, they knew in conventional warfare, it will take China many, many decades to catch up. So that's why the clever thing is, they are very good in uh, uh, learning from old strategy. You know, I used to say the Chinese Communist Party, they damaged a lot of Chinese traditional culture, except one, and that is strategy. You know, in old China, in the time, uh, say, two, 500 years before Christ, yeah, in China, there were many, many brilliant uh, strategies, yeah, because there was, uh, the, the, the time was called the warring states. You know, China was divided into seven, I think, uh, states fighting each other. So they developed a lot, a lot of uh, uh, strategy. Yeah, and I remember one of one of the strategy or one of the principle in strategy is they say it is great to win a war, but it is much better to win without a war. And this is what they have been doing. Yeah, to win a war, I mean a conventional war against America is too tough. Yeah, so let's uh, win the cyber war, win the media war, win the financial war, win the economic war, and so on and so on. And this has, they have been extremely successful. Be, and not because only because the, uh, many clever Chinese uh, were brainwashed by the party and happened. That's not the only reason. Another reason is too many people in the free world have been sleeping. We, you know, we never think in terms of, particularly in Sweden. I've been living 14 years in Sweden. Yeah? Uh, it's very seldom a Swiss, when you look at the world, to think who is our enemy, who is our friend. Yeah? But I tell you, 100 millions and 100 millions of Chinese, since they are a child, they learn to see who is our enemy, who is our first enemy, who is second our second enemy. Yeah? And they all learn that USA is our enemy number one. You look is enemy number two, potential enemy number two. But we'll, let's try to win over enemy number two to fight against enemy number one. So China has been nicer to Europe, so to say, yeah, than the US. But of course, it doesn't mean that they are always showing an aggressive face. No, because one of those old traditional strategies is use perception as a magic weapon. So. The Chinese Communist Party has, since the time of Deng Xiaoping, yeah, when after Mao, have been applying deception as, as their main strategy to influence Western society or society of all democratic country and the free world, and to to influence them, to to control them, to monitor them. So, ladies and gentlemen, already. Again, my personal <laughs> experience, 10 years ago, I used to have a, a business partner who are in, uh, in high tech. You know, he, he run a company selling uh, uh, things like uh, uh, content management system, you know, intelligent one, and also so-called one-to-one marketing system. One-to-one marketing system meaning you collect a lot of data about people, also big data, and then you figure out every individual person what they need to buy what they want to buy what is their interest from the technological point of view is exactly the same as what the communist party is using for political reason yeah but technically it's the same thing so and this friend of mine he suddenly when he found out my uh, my view about uh, chinese communist party then he said manian uh, make sure you don't use any mobile phone from Huawei or Z ZTE, and you don't use a computer from Lenovo, and you don't buy anything from Alibaba. <laughs> uh, I, I pretend not to understand. I say why? <laughs> so to let him let him to tell me more. He say, you know what? I used to be uh, IT department head of of uh, of uh, secret service of one of the European country I, for his uh, security I don't mention which country yeah one of the European country the EU country yeah and so he knows what has been going on behind the scene he say already 
already one year ago, they had the, all these big company I mentioned, they have agreed to the party leadership to provide them all data they have collected. So, ladies and gentlemen, maybe you have been using Alibaba, maybe you have been using TikTok uh, from the company ByteDance, and so on and so on. Or maybe you even use a Huawei a mobile phone or, or, you know, all this uh, IT system from China. Your personal data are all correct, collected in a huge big data process system, processing system, okay? Uh, so in Hong Kong, they are already using it to quickly catch all the so-called uh, dissidents or, or protesting people. Uh, in Sweden, they, they don't start catching yet, but they are getting them, themselves prepared, okay? So the question is, we now should know it is very dangerous, yeah? I know that some people told me, uh, well, you see, I, I'm living in Germany now. Some German business friend, they say, yeah, uh, a German uh, politician, they say, yeah, but we are too dependent on, on China economically. I, I used to tell them, you know what? Uh, assuming I have been doing business with a company, and one day I discover this company actually is the mafia. The whole company is just a mafia. They pretend to Sorry, be... Sorry, Anne, Anne, there is uh, 12 minutes already, so if you can just wrap up. And what yeah, uh, I will, I will, I will, yeah. So, so what... In that case, I say, I was, what shall I do? Decouple, decouple, but in a smart way. You plan it in advance, step by step, decouple. So, my advice to Sweden, you have done a good job in saying no to Huawei, but that is only a small step in the decoupling. Yeah, But you better think about decoupling a lot more. Yeah, And, you know, look at India, they have, they have banned some 120 Chinese app for, 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 for mobile phone and so on, yeah? Uh, for that's for the security reason. And you should also make sure that work together with EU, work together with America, because we work together with the whole free world, because it is a fight, it is a war between freedom and tyranny. It's not a fight yeah. between China Thank and you. US, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Anne Manian, for your presentation. And uh, I think uh, this talk about uh, acquisitions and investment, especially into high technology companies, is something very important. Uh, some of the earlier speakers mentioned uh, there's a second Cold War going on right now, and that is uh, something that uh, the relation between China and the US, uh, the situation is um, often uh, often called the second uh, Cold War. And it's important to understand that uh, this Cold War is not about uh, uh, tanks and nuclear bombs. It's the First World War is more about the uh, high technology. Uh, Chi uh, Chinese uh, Communist Party want to get uh, self-reliant on uh, yeah manufacturing uh, semiconductors and microchips and so on and so forth and for our Swedish listeners uh, on Friday uh, there will be a long uh, feature uh, that I wrote for the Swedish magazine Focus uh, it's uh, I think they will be the, uh, the feature of the week and it's about um, Chinese investments into high technology companies in Europe and Sweden. So that is a bit of more information how what kind of uh, methods uh, China might be using to uh, to get its hands get its hands on uh, European technology. Uh, good. Then we have uh, finished all the four presentations, and uh, then it's time for us to move on to questions. And we have. 25 minutes, half an hour, and uh, if anyone wants to uh, ask a question, there is two ways to do this. Uh, either you can write uh, in the chat, uh, which you can find in the top right corner of uh, your screen. Please write not the full question first, uh, or ju just mention that you want to ask a question. Uh, or you can raise hand, uh, which is in the bottom menu. When you raise the hand, I will uh, I will see that someone has raised the hand, and uh, I will eventually uh, let the person ask a question. Uh, 
Unfortunately, I was dropped out from the from the talk a few minutes ago, so I can't see the chat history because I remember it. There was three persons already that wanted to ask a question, and uh, now one of them raised the hand again, and that's Alexander Kristiansson. Uh, so, Alexander, uh, would you like to ask your question in the in the chat, or would you like to be uh, connected with the sound? I think that our uh, uh, moderator can fix that. Perfect. I would rather sound if it's possible. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, please ask your question, and then I will see. Maybe I will try to make a short comment on it myself, and then I will see who of our four speakers uh, who uh, appear to be most suited to, to answer the question. So please go ahead and ask. Great. Thank you. Um, my name is Alexander Christiansen from the Sweden Democrats of the Swedish Parliament, and I just had two short, short questions. And um, the, the one, the first one is is uh, combined with the, what Elmer Young was talking about about the, the Trump administration and the trade deal that's been going on, and uh, I was just wanted to know what the consequences will be uh, when Biden takes office. What do you think? What would will be going on after that? And the other one is um, your take on the foreign governments around the world. If, if we are taking this threat seriously enough, and if we don't, what do you consider us, uh, what should we do? Like, what, what's, your, what's your take on that as well? Yeah, that would be my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, this yeah, is Elmer. So, please, uh, take, uh, can I the answer? first question, uh, like, yeah, yeah, the first question I would like Elmer to answer, and then the second question I would probably uh, let, uh, Wong Yik Mo answered that one, but Elmer, please uh, answer the question about the yeah, trade, if, uh, uh, the if, trade uh, we have and what will be the Sure, if Joe Biden becomes the president, everything Donald Trump has done in the last four years will be undone. So you can very easily imagine uh, uh, the, it will return to the Obama days. Very, very simple. Everything, he will undo everything. That's his promise. And uh, it's far more than a Cold War. This is far more than a Cold War. This is really the free world against the, the Chinese, Communist, Chinese Communist Party. And they are, their dominance is way beyond China. Look at Vatican, look at Vatican. You should really notice the secret agreement they have with Vatican. Even Vatican they can control, WHO, WTO, human rights under UN and United Nations itself is, is under their control. You guys are not safe. You think, oh, Europe, you can continue to do business. That's not the case. Their ambition is to first to have the European Asian land block, landmark, and then later on, eventually, they want to control the North America. They are, they're already in Africa, South America, very easy for them. They're dying to have some money from China. And their, their next objective is coming through Middle East, Central Asia, and then to Eastern Europe and Europe. But fortunately, this time, uh, at least uh, Donald Trump has woke us up. I know nobody likes Donald Trump. I know very well. But compare, compare from one to 10, China is, their, is our number one enemy. And Donald Trump is our number 10. And one more thing I want to add. Don't read the major media. The mainstream media are all bought by China. In Hong Kong, even the Apple Daily, which is the strongest in most independent, now is kowtowing to China. All right? And USA, all the mainstream media, you name it, don't read them. The one to read is the Epic Times. Seriously, they are the only one who is willing to stand up against the communist China. It's a very, very serious problem. I don't know how to speak, but... I okay, Elmer, thank you. Tonight. Thank you for uh, thank you. Thank you for answer. We have a few more questions here, so we'll have to go on. Uh, regarding your question, Alexander, uh, I was actually looking a bit closer into this, uh, with the, the trade war uh, that you have between China and the US. And according to most uh, analysis and uh, predictions, uh, I think that Joe Biden is not a fan of... Uh, Having those, uh, Joe Biden is not a fan of having extra uh, trade uh, obstacles, so he will probably not impose anything uh, 
more like uh, higher taxes on uh, Chinese uh, goods, but he will probably also not recall them uh, because he will probably use them as leverage in uh, in a discussion with the Chinese government and other issues. Anyway, the second question that you had, Alexander, was regarding did the foreign governments uh, take the threat from China seriously? And if they don't, what should the foreign governments do that they are not doing today? And this is a question that uh, Wang Yipmo has been working a lot with, especially in the uh, European context. So please, uh, Wang Yipmo, answer that question. All right. Um... I think um, foreign governments, especially in Europe, uh, you are, uh, well, you're not taking threat from China seriously. Well, I, I think you know there is a threat, but um, uh, foreign governments, especially uh, trying to balance business and human rights, which is understandable because you are also responsible for your own countries, which, um, well, I think this is understandable. And that's why we have to discuss um, why having trading with China is actually harmful to your, um, to your nationals. Um, I think many foreign countries are being naive, uh, especially when dealing with COVID-19. Um, well, we have warned very early that COVID-19 is coming to the whole world, but um, nobody in Europe or in the US were willing, uh, willing to wear masks. Um, I was discriminated against when I was in business trip in in, in Denmark um, and back in February. And now look at what happens there. What in Hong Kong we cannot control, but in Taiwan we are smart and we know China is not, um, is a threat. And that's why we don't uh, have uh, COVID-19 here in Taiwan. And uh, in, in regard with trade, I think um, Europe underestimated China. Of course, balancing business and human rights is very important. But um, look what happened back in the days when Europe believed in China, that uh, making China uh, um, rich will make China also democratic. It was a fail failure. So I think what we should do is to reweigh business and politics because economics is politics and politics is economy. Only with a stable, uh, independent economy from China, then you can uh, talk about human rights, which is also your value. I think Elmer was right just now in his speech that um, first China will let you earn money, uh, which is very easy at the beginning. But when you become dependent on them or when China uh, become richer than you, then the control starts. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. And uh, there is, of course, uh, a lot more to say on both of those topics. And uh, we will do that another day because we have four more questions uh, so far. And uh, the next person who wants to ask something here to our speakers is uh, David Lega. So please, uh, if uh, we can get some sound to David Lega, so ask a question. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. My name is David Lega. I'm a member of the European Parliament from the Christian Democrats in Sweden and a member of EPP group within the European Parliament. And I totally agree with you that the European Union woke up too late regarding how to treat China as the, the threat it has become. But I also believe that the view towards China today have changed regarding Hong Kong, regarding Taiwan, uh, regarding the situation for Uyghurs, for example. So I have two short questions. One is, we are trying to form new ways of collaboration to work together. Uh, for example, the IPAC Alliance, uh, which I'm a member of, but also within Brussels, the Hong Kong uh, Watch Group. How do you view these kinds of collaboration? And do you believe they can make a difference? Um, and also, we are working harder with demands on reciprocity, sanctions, uh, and conditionality regarding the follow-up on our own statutes. Uh, so you have partly answered it, but what, in your view, should we further do at this stage where we are exactly now to make a larger difference? Um, it would be interesting to hear concrete suggestions on how to proceed. Thank you. And thank you for being a part of this uh, very important discussion. Thank you very much, uh, David. And uh, your two questions here. Uh, the first one regarding uh, alliances and organizations. And uh, 
so on, and especially with regards to Hong Kong. I would like uh, Vasilius uh, to answer that one, and then the second question, which is about uh, yeah, the quiet uh, in in the same uh, area as Alexander's uh, question. What uh, what can we do uh, more? Is the sanctions and corruption and so on? Uh, I would like uh, Anne Mania to answer that question. So, uh, please, the first one, if uh, Vasilius, if you will, can you answer uh, that question? Yes, uh, I would say like this. Of course, all those kind of uh, uh, alliances, I would say, between the three countries to counter the, the threat from Chinese Communist Party is, of course, very good. However, uh, what what we need to stop it is actually um, uh, to have laws that uh, stop them. For, uh, let me tell you why I say this. Because uh, what I said before was that the Chinese Communist Party, they have this saying, strangle the enemy with their own systems. So, I mean, they can come here and they use our democratic system, they use our rule of law, so that they can, you know, uh, they use our private enterprises, they can just buy companies, right? And when they buy companies, they have leverage. So so this is a major issue that uh, I think needs to be solved. And now I know that uh, Sweden is working on this kind of administration. Stop uh, foreign companies, and this is, of course, directed to China, especially, uh, specifically, I would say. Uh, so, so this is maybe... Uh, so, I mean, although it's, of course, what you're saying is needed, we need to have these kind of alliances and working through these kinds of organizations. However, we also need to to stop what they are doing in this kind of way, where we have, you know, we just uh, have laws that stop them, because otherwise they can continue. Because how, however many alliances we have or, or, you know, organizations working for this, they will still use our system to, to do what they want. And um, uh, another thing is that I can agree here with David Lega that the view has changed. I mean, the Swedish people views uh, about the Chinese Communist Party has changed, right? I mean, maybe four percent we know now are negative. And um, this is very good. However, if you look at in the business circles, I mean, lately we have read the uh, doggies industry, you know, they, they think it's, you know, it's not very good that uh, we stop uh, Huawei because, <laughs> we, you know, uh, because they are cheap, they are good, we lose money. But I would say like this, why nothing has happened for so many years is because we have treated all those issues as like human rights issues. Like, I mean... The Uyghurs, you know, the Falun Gong, the Tibetans, the every, it's human rights issues, right? So human rights compared to business and jobs means nothing. I mean, this is from a realistic point of view, right? But now, if we can see that this is actually national security issues, if we can understand this, it will be a big difference. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, if you have uh, anything uh, to uh, reply to David's uh, second question, it would be interesting to hear your view on that. Okay. First, uh, I think it's important for us to understand uh, Ch Chinese Communist Party has not become worse now in the recent years. Uh, doing all this in Hong Kong and so on and so on in the world. No, it is part of the master plan. The master plan as formulated by Deng Xiaoping was hide our strength and wait for our time or bide our time, which means, you know, today they think the time has come to show their strength, you know, before is to hide the strength. So don't think that they were better off, they were better when they were hiding their strength. Okay, so uh, then the question, I, ended, I remember the question was, uh, what else we can do? I think the first step Sweden and all other uh, democratic countries should do is to, to demand for a reciprocal relationship in trade, in everything. You know, Donald Trump actually was right in that. He said it must be reciprocal. If China can, can uh, you know, even uh, make ads 
put the China Daily uh, every week in uh, Washington uh, Post and in uh, New York Times and so on, then we must also be allowed to do the same thing. But this is not the case. It's incredible. In China, it's zero press freedom. Foreign press have no chance to spread around in China. Okay, so I, and many other things, you know, in trade, in cultural exchange, in uh, scientific exchange, everything. It has not been reciprocal. They could utilize all the freedom and openness of our society and block us for everything they want to block at ours. So that that is the first step we have to do. And the second step, as I mentioned before, you have to have a step-by-step -step plan how to decouple with Chinese economy and Chinese politics as long as there is a Chinese Communist Party ruling this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I also think personally think that this uh, reciprocity, which in Swedish we would say omsesidighet, uh, is uh, something very uh, important. Uh, a lot of things that uh, Chinese companies, media are allowed to do in Western countries would, would never ever happen for uh, the, the other way around. And uh, yeah, that's dangerous waters. And now we have uh, about 10 minutes left for questions. And we have actually five people who want to ask some questions here. I'm not sure if we can uh, make time for all of it, but we can try to keep our answers uh, slightly shorter so that we might be able to answer more of those questions. Next person who, who want to uh, ask something is Bo Bialgard Wasmussen. Uh, would you please let us know your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, I, uh, my name is Bo. Uh, I'm an independent businessman from Denmark. I have a background uh, before being independent as a Danish diplomat. I have also been serving in China. Um, we are, as has been pointed out, in the middle of a Cold War. We are still talking about how to defend ourselves from China. That's a, a limited strategy. How do we carry, so to speak, the war to the enemy's uh, uh, shores? As long as we buy, uh, just sit back and uh, try to defend ourselves, we leave the initiative to uh, the Chinese Communist Party how do we start bothering them so they don't have so much energy to uh, uh, invade uh, uh, our systems? Uh, can we help uh, Western comp uh, companies that will disengage from the Chinese markets? How can we do that? Can we start uh, doing something where we promote more relationship with the countries in Southeast Asia Japan, Taiwan, that surround Korea, that uh, surrounds China. How can we uh, do things actively? How can we uh, make it visible to the China, China Communist Party that we don't believe in the by We don't want to hear you talk. Uh, we don't want to receive any cultural exchanges from you because the Communist Party of China is the uh, entity that has been destroying traditional Chinese culture rather than promoting it. Uh, I don't know who should answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you both. So yeah, uh, how do we gain the initiative? Uh, how do we end uh, the passiveness that we can see now? Uh, how do uh, we uh, yeah put uh, put pressure on China before they reach our shores as uh, Bo was uh, expressing it here? Uh, maybe Elmer could uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to answer that question. Please try to keep it about a minute or so. A minute or so. Yeah, I'd like very much a, to a answer that question. Yeah. I've been in Washington yeah. for four months, and I've been lobbying at the Congress to designate the Chinese Communist Party as a transnational criminal organization and all its members as mafia criminals. And if we are able to do that, then automatically everybody will watch out. When you sign a contract, you make sure that the guy sitting opposite to you is not a communist. And the communists will not be allowed to come to your country and then doing all kinds of infiltration. So this is my solution is to designate the CCP as a transnational communist uh, criminal organization. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, yeah, Vasilis, is very, very quick. Very, very quick, Vasilis. I can, yes, I would also like to add this. Very good, I would say, this initiative. I would like to add that as soon as we talk about businesses and doing business, we also need to add the aspect of money, right? So for the businesses to decouple from China, they also need support from the government, probably. Like Japan has done, putting about $2 billion dollars in helping Japanese companies move out from China back to Japan or other countries or like the US is planning to do. So this is also something that needs to be considered from a political standpoint, I mean. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, that's correct. You can see the same trend in, for instance, uh, Western universities. Uh, many of them are economically dependent on the Chinese students right now. And uh, that makes uh, yeah, a tool for the Chinese government to put pressure on those countries. So one method that has been suggested to counter that uh, situation is that uh, yeah, the foreign government should go in and pay more for the public universities uh, in order to make uh, universities less dependent on uh, China. And I think, of course, the same can be done with companies as have already happened in Japan, as, as you mentioned. Uh, we have only a few minutes left, and uh, someone suggested to take more questions in a row to make it faster, but I would rather prioritize quality before quantity here, and uh, I think we can do maybe two or three more questions. Next person in line is uh, Yasmin Nilsson. Uh, please, if you would like to ask a question. Thank you so very much. Uh, well, my name is actually Yasmin Posio, and I'm a member of the Swedish parliament representing the left party. And uh, I would like to let you know that all parties in the Committee on Foreign Affairs cooperated on a committee report on China, which is mostly unusual. The different parties in Sweden rarely ever agree all together. But since the imprisonment of Guy Minhai, and the way China buys into Swedish companies and the way the Chinese ambassador in Sweden acts towards uh, members of parliament and Swedish media, we agreed that we needed to act together. And that's what I believe is one way uh, to work uh, towards showing China that we stand together. Um, in the left party, we believe that Sweden as a democratic country who values human rights very highly and believe that everyone is equal, we have to cooperate with other countries that has the same values. We have to work multilaterally to reach that point that we all together can stand up to China and say that the way they are acting is not okay. Um, a lot of you have, have spoken about Trump being a good guy to listen to, but he doesn't believe in multilateralism. And we who want to cooperate with other democratic countries that believe in human rights and that everyone is equal to each other. Um, do you have, can you see other ways that we can work together uh, to show China that the way they are acting is not okay? And I also would like to know what can we do to support people in Hong Kong, the people on the streets, not only, you know, on the big scale uh, when it comes to, to, to acting against China, but, but to, to get support to the people protesting on the streets. Because as a, as a leftist, I really believe in solidarity with the people rising against the power. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yasmin. So I could, uh, I could understand that you had two questions here. And the first question, we already touched upon it actually a couple of times. And I would like to go to the, question, the second question, which I think is very important. How can we help uh, people on the ground in Hong Kong right now? And uh, I know that uh, Wang Yikmo just came back from Hong Kong uh, in uh, June, if I remember correctly. So that was only a few months ago. Uh, could you please tell us, uh, Wang Yikmo, what could uh, yeah, Western politicians and also the, the public opinion, what can, we, what can we do to help people on the ground in Hong Kong? Um, right. Thank you, Yasmin, for the question. Uh, good to see you again. Um, well, uh, I think um, to support Hong Kong, um, there are many ways. Um, as you mentioned, how to support the Hong Kong um, still in the street. What I have to say, uh, sadly, uh, we cannot protest in the street anymore. Um, and uh, because of the, uh, um, 
the regulations now, the law, national security law, um, it's actually impossible to protest in Hong Kong. But uh, many people left Hong Kong, and um, although I think that's not ideal, but uh, we we try to uh, uh, um, conserve our culture, and um, we, we we try to um, um, to rest and prepare for the next wave. For example, um, I'm in Taiwan. Many people are in Taiwan, and uh, some of them choose to go to UK or to Canada. Um, there are uh, a few things that we need because we don't have time. I will go directly. Um, um, there are restrictions, um, and I think it's good that uh, Sweden also opens up the lifeboat scheme, as discussed in the e uh, European Parliament. I think David Liga uh, knows about. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Hong Kongers are not going to storm into Sweden and create a crisis. Um, people normally choose English-speaking countries, but I think it's very important for people to, you know, to choose different destinations and to learn different things from different countries and tell different stories. So I think a lifeboat scheme is very good, and um, I think funding is another problem. Um, people now are uh, um, using up the funding from Hong Kong, so um, uh, and gigs. Uh, uh, what a celebrity in Hong Kong is raising funds in Hong Kong to support. Uh, uh, protesters in Taiwan and in other countries. Um, he has been arrested, um, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday. So I think, although um, it's, it, it doesn't sound nice to talk about money, but I think funding is actually very important. So if there's any way, maybe from the government, maybe from civil societies, to provide fundings uh, for protesters from Hong Kong, I think there will be a great help. Thank you very much. So, yeah, uh, we are a couple of minutes uh, after our schedule now, so I would like to ask the organizers if it's possible to uh, raise another question or how, how are we doing time-wise? I will take that as a yes, uh, since no one interrupted. I yeah, yeah, I Matthias? think we can have a short question, and I will wrap it up after that. So, one last question. May I? May I? Thank you. Yeah. So let's take one more question, and the last one for the evening, and uh, that is Matthias Tegnier. Please ask your question. No, I, I, I will, I will uh, wrap up the meeting and thank everybody. <laughs> so it would be very rude that I take the last question. So please uh, uh, give uh, someone else the possibility of asking. Can, can I give an answer to the last question about? Yeah, Trump? sorry about that. Uh, very, very briefly, very briefly. Okay, uh, very briefly. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, when I when I say something positive about Trump, it's not because of uh, any personal things. Yeah, it is a fact that America is the strongest power in the world since Second World War. Right now, uh, and that you you guys have to be aware that Chinese Communist Party understand that they are their biggest uh, danger. I mean, USA. They look at USA as their biggest danger. So they have been spending a huge effort through deception and other things uh, to, to manage this problem. So now you have to be aware that for many, many decades, President from Clinton to Bush to, to Obama, they have done nothing against China. They have just been feeding this dangerous red dragon. And now the red dragon is big and bites back, okay? And Donald Trump, no matter what you think about him, is the first president since decades who is going to use America as the strongest power to fix this problem. So you guys have to understand, uh, the, the Europe can never manage it themselves. Forget it. You yeah. have to be, Thank, yeah. you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, I see we have one question in, in the line about Norway. Uh, <clears throat> I think that we should uh, take another question is that to utilize the expertise you have in the, in the panel. But uh, when it comes to Norway and the free trade agreement, let me just say very quickly here that, uh, yeah, Norway is uh, in, in between a rock and a hard place because it's not a European Union member. Uh, so it will have to, uh, you have to uh, yeah, negotiate its own treaties with China and also since 2016 when Norway had to apologize for Lucia Borg with the Nobel Peace Prize. In general, Norway is very, very reluctant to uh, oppose anything that China does. So, yeah, quick answer to that question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think that some other countries will uh, 
think that it's it, it's a it's a move in the wrong direction. But uh, Norway and China has a very very complicated relationship uh, that's far too uh, too long to go in, into here. Uh, we have in the panel one digital publisher, and we also have one uh, expert on artificial intelligence and data. So Nils Parup Peterson, please ask. Uh, your question about the digital sphere, and then we will have uh, two very short answers. Thank you very much. Am I? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's because uh, the war that we are talking about is basically a digital war at the moment, uh, more or less. So I would like to know the countries that you find have uh, applied the most uh, or the best policies to prevent. Uh, China from winning this digital war by taking over the the tech uh, side of most countries. So, like good examples, one of you mentioned India before, who's uh, sorry cancelled a few quite a lot of apps. But uh, what other good examples are there? Thank you. Yeah, Vasilios, please. Uh, do you have any examples of uh, countries who have a good strategy to uh, to handle the digital war, or for that sake, the, the high tech war that we see now? Yes, yes. I mean, India was mentioned here, and of course, India has a very special situation, right? Because they are like a border to, to China, so and they have had some some fighting going on. So it's understandable that they take these measures. But also, I would say that the U.S. is attached to the forefront for doing this. The situation today has uh, also banned and and uh, is moving to ban more. Uh, apps from from China, so I would say they are the ones leading leading this uh, this ch challenge. Yeah. Yes. But uh, on Mangan, do you have anything to add to that uh, question? Well, yeah, very short. Uh, I agree with what uh, Vasily said. Uh, America has been doing a lot of things since uh, Donald Trump came to power. It's a fact. By the way, uh, about uh, uh, maybe three four months back, uh, uh, Donald Trump decided. To, to, to spend uh, $3 billion to pull down the Chinese Great Firewall. And that is important because that solves a lot of problems. You see, the Chinese Communist Party can do a lot of evil stuff only because they manage to cheat so many Chinese. And that is because of the firewall. And if you manage to pull it down, yeah, then the Chinese will wake up and they are the people who can really change the Communist Party or get rid of them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I must add also personally that I think Taiwan uh, is very vigilant on this uh, issue. Uh, Taiwan is often, often overlooked because it doesn't have the status as a country in many forms. But uh, yeah, Taiwan is uh, treating this uh, issue very, 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 very seriously. And just uh, last week, there was uh, one of the pro-China uh, TV channels here, Zhongtian uh, Simen Wang, CTI in uh, Chinese. Now, they don't get a new permission to uh, to continue to broadcast <laughs> here in Taiwan, which is uh, a very uh, serious uh, step that I think many other countries don't have to take. But in Taiwan, is is treating this uh, threat from uh, the digital and uh, data threat from from China in a very serious matter. Yeah, that was all the questions we had time for tonight. And so please, Matthias, would you uh, take, uh, take over the word and finish the seminar? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jo Yen. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to, to thank uh, everybody uh, Yuyu for, for moderating ISHR, uh, Shanghi and Tendriabet for co-organizing and of course also our speakers. I'm sure that uh, all of us will have a lot of things to think about after uh, this meeting, both uh, including the threat from, from China, but, but also how we can defend ourselves without uh, attacking our own democracy and our own free uh, press, which is of course very important, and I think that's why, for example, the Chinese ambassador is attacking free media in in Sweden. So it's very important that we, when we are trying to to promote uh, uh, democracy and and uh, fighting these issues, not uh, attack uh, the the foundation of of, of um, open societies. With that said, I thank you all for for uh, participating and I'm sure that we will uh, have uh, good reasons to continue the discussion. So thank you so much, everybody.